Well, are you ready to get into y'all's word today? I am as well. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to begin with verse 5 in just a moment. And I've entitled this message today, As in the Days of Noah. So we're tracking along with the Torah portion today. And the Torah portion is entitled Noah or Noah. And so we're going to be talking about the events that transpired during the days of Noah, during the days of the great flood. And then we're going to go into the future and we're going to look at the events that will take place in the future at the time of Yeshua's return and at the time of the judgment that's coming in the future. And we're going to see that the events that take place then are very similar to the events that took place during the days of Noah. So let's begin. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And Yah saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you imagine that? So there was great wickedness in the earth, and every inclination, every thought, every imagination of the heart of man was only evil continually. He didn't have good thoughts. He wasn't doing good things. His thoughts and imaginations were continually evil. And Yah was sorry that He had made man on the earth. I think about the creation week, you know, the six days of work that Abba Yah did in Genesis chapter 1. And He labored each day. He was creating wonderful things. And He said, it's good. He saw it and He said, it's good. But now it's not good because man had spiraled down into such great depravity and perversion and evil and wickedness. And now he was sorry that he had made man on the earth. The Bible says, and he was grieved in his heart. And Yah said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature and the birds of the heavens, for I am sorry or I regret that I have made them. So it's so much different than that first work week in Genesis 1. Now in Genesis 6, he's looking. The earth is filled with evil men and they have defiled the earth because of their atrocities, their abominations, their wickedness, their perversions. And now his heart is grieved and he regrets having made men. Verse 8, But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yah. Your Bible may say grace. I like this translation better. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yah. Noah was a different type of person. Noah was a righteous man. He lived rightly before Yah. He obeyed the voice of Yah. He walked in the ways of Yah. And because of that, he found favor in the eyes of Yah. And Yah had a plan, a plan of deliverance, a plan of salvation for Noah and his entire family. Verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. How are you a righteous man? That's when you live rightly, when you obey the commandments, when you are a person who obeys and you do not disobey. It says, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim. You don't get to walk with Elohim unless you walk in his ways. So Noah listened to the voice of Elohim. He obeyed Elohim. He learned the ways of Elohim. And he walked in the ways of Elohim. And because of that, he walked with Elohim. Verse 10, and Noah brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the earth was corrupt before Elohim. And the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt. And he's not talking about the land specifically. He's talking about mankind. Mankind had behaved so horribly with such great sin and transgression, wickedness, perversion that mankind had defiled the earth. Notice it says, for all flesh, 
speaking of mankind, had corrupted their way on the earth. They weren't walking in Yah's ways. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. Verse 13, And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. In other words, I have judged mankind. I have looked upon their wickedness, upon their evil thoughts and inclinations of their hearts, and I have judged them. I have made a decision. He cannot be a righteous judge unless he judges sin, unless he judges depravity. And so he's speaking to Noah and he says, The end of all flesh has come before me. I have judged mankind. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And see, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with a covering or pitch or tar. And so this tells us that even though Abba Yah had judged mankind, he had a plan for Noah and his family. He had a plan for the righteous one and his family. And his plan was to bring deliverance, to bring salvation to the righteous one and his family. He was going to do it through an ark. Then look at verse 17. It says, And see, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under the heavens. All that is on the earth is to die. That's the judgment. And I shall establish my covenant with you. So we see that Abba Yah established a covenant with Noah. And you shall come into the ark, the ark of safety, the ark of salvation. You shall come in to my plan of deliverance, to my plan of salvation for you and your family. It says, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And then look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. This is going to show us a wonderful picture of Yeshua, that Yeshua himself is the ark of safety. When we believe upon Yeshua, we enter into him. In him, the scripture says. We enter into the ark of salvation. When we believe upon him with a belief that produces obedience, we have the right to enter into Yeshua. And Yeshua is that ark. He's the ark of salvation. And then we rise up above the future judgment that is to come. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And Yah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. So there is a plan for the righteous one. If you're righteous in your generation, Abba Yah has a plan. And His plan is deliverance. His plan is salvation. And that salvation comes through belief in Yeshua, a belief that produces obedience. And so notice here it says, you and your household. So there's a thread throughout the entire Bible of a promise of household salvation. We see even with Shaul and Silas, when they were thrown into the prison, and they were down in the bottom of the prison, their feet were in stocks, their backs were bloodied, and they could have been complaining and murmuring against the Almighty for all that had transpired, but they weren't. Instead, they were praying and singing praises, and Abba Yah sends an earthquake. And that earthquake shakes that prison. The stocks fall off. The doors open up. Abba Yah brings a great deliverance. And the prison keeper, he hears the testimony of Shaul and Silas. He hears their prayers and their praise. He experiences the earthquake. He sees the deliverance. And it impacts him greatly. And so he asks, what must I do? To be saved. And Shaul says, Believe upon the Master Yeshua Messiah, and you shall be saved, you and your household. There it is again. There's a thread of a promise of household salvation that runs throughout the entire Bible. And so I want to encourage you, because many of you who are watching, you have embraced Yeshua and his Torah lifestyle. And because of that, you've been isolated. You've been cast off. You've been separated, segmented. 
You feel all alone. Even your own family doesn't have much to do with you. But I want to encourage you. There is a thread of the promise of household salvation throughout the Bible. And I want to encourage you just to continue to let your light so shine. Let your light shine. The scripture says that the command is a lamp and the Torah is a light. It says, let your light so shine that men and women would see your good works as defined by the Torah, your obedience to the Torah, and have a desire to greatly esteem your Father who's in the heavenlies. And if you'll live out this life, it's a life of love. It's a life of obedience. It's a life of right living before Almighty Yah. Then your family will see you. And you can believe and hold on to this promise of household salvation. And over time, I believe, as it says in the scripture, that we all can have that hope and that belief that all of our family members will not only know Yeshua, but will embrace Him and His Torah lifestyle. So this is just a word of encouragement for all of you at this time. It says, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Of all the clean beasts, take with you seven pairs, a male and his female, and of the beasts that are unclean, two, a male and his female. Isn't it interesting that even Noah knew about clean and unclean? This is before Moshe. This is before the Torah of Moshe was given. And yet Noah, who was one of the ancients, he knew about clean and unclean animals. Hallelujah. Verse 3, And of the birds of the heavens, seven pairs, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I am sending rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, it's going to rain, and shall wipe from the face of the earth all that stand that I created. And Noah did according to all that Yah commanded him. Now, that phrase is a given. Because the reason that Noah has been singled out for the blessing and for deliverance and for salvation is because he is a man who did according to all that Yah commanded him. That was his habit. He was a righteous man who was a man of obedience. And so there's two camps in the world today, those who obey and those who disobey. So which camp are you in? Verse 6, now Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Now look at verse 10. And it came to be after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second new moon or the second new month, the 17th day of the moon of the month, on that day all the foundations of the great deep were broken up and the windows of the heavens were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So this was a great, great, great flood. It was the judgment of Almighty Yah upon the wickedness and the abominations and the cruelty and the violence of mankind. And there was one man in his family, a righteous man, who entered into the ark of safety, the ark of salvation, the ark of deliverance. And when the judgment came, this man Noah and his family rose above the waters of judgment. Hallelujah. What a wonderful picture of what we have in Yeshua, who is our ark of salvation. Look at verse 17. And the flood was on the earth 40 days, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth, and the waters were mighty and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters were exceedingly mighty on the earth, and all the high mountains under all the heavens were covered. The waters became mighty, 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died. That's the judgment. The creeping creature on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, 
and every swarming creature that swarms on the earth and all mankind. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he wiped off all that stand which were on the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature and bird of the heavens, and they were wiped off from the earth. And only Noah was left and those with him in the ark, in the ark of salvation. And the waters were mighty on the earth, 150 days. Now, I want us to go over to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to pick up with verse 17. And I want to show you that the flood pictures Yeshua's work of redemption in a wonderful and marvelous way. Verse 17, For it is better, if it is the desire of Elohim, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So it's better if you suffer because you're righteous. It's better if you suffer for doing good than if you're punished for doing evil. Verse 18, because even Messiah once suffered for sins, not his own. That's the point. Abba Yah could at any point exact judgment on mankind for the sins of mankind. Abba Yah could exact judgment and bring every person to a place of perishing again. But that wasn't his plan. Instead, he provided his son. And his son, Yeshua, lived perfectly. He was without sin. He was the sinless, spotless lamb of Yah who came to take away the sin of the world and to taste our death, to suffer our judgment. In other words, Yeshua suffered the floodwaters of judgment, so to speak, for all of us who deserved it. He says, because even Messiah once suffered for sins. He sure did. The righteous for the unrighteous. I call that the great exchange. He was righteous. Noah pictured Yeshua. Noah was a righteous man. Yeshua was the ultimate righteous man because he never sinned, not once. He's the righteous one. And he suffered and died in our place. Those of us, which is all humanity, loaded down with sins. He took our sins from us and He gave us His righteousness. That's the great exchange. He took our sins from us and He gave us His righteousness. It says, because even Messiah once suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to Elohim. That's how we got to Elohim. Because Yeshua is the ark of salvation. He's the ark of safety. Having been put to death indeed in flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So if you see it in the terms of the flood, Yeshua suffered the judgment waters of the flood, so to speak. He died in the flesh. He suffered our judgment. And then he was raised from the dead and he was made alive in the Spirit because of his righteous act. Verse 19, in which also he went and proclaimed unto the spirits in prison who were disobedient at one time when the patience of Elohim waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight beings, were saved through water. And so what some people don't realize is that Noah was a preacher. He was a proclaimer of Teshuvah. He preached repentance to the people. He did all that he could do in preaching the good news of repentance to turn the situation around. But the people were so wicked and the imaginations of their hearts were so inclined to evil continually that they wouldn't hear. And they were in complete disobedience. It says that eight beings 
out of all of mankind were saved through water. Now this is interesting. Verse 21, which figure now also saves us. And that's immersion. So the flood actually pictures water baptism. So Yeshua died in our place. He suffered the floodwaters of judgment that we deserved. He took our sin. He became sin. The scripture says, He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of Elohim in Yeshua Messiah. His flesh died just like all of those sinners during the time of Noah. Their flesh died in the floodwaters of judgment. Yeshua's flesh died, taking our judgment upon Himself. But because of His righteous act of redemption, Abba Yah raised Him from the dead. He became alive in the Spirit. And the Scripture says that we also die to our flesh, and we are buried with Him in immersion. So the sins of the flesh, the old man, dies when we believe in Yeshua and we receive the promise of the Father. The indwelling set-apart spirit of Abba Yah comes to live inside of us. The old man dies in the flood, in the water of immersion. But it says we are raised with Yeshua to walk in newness of life. So we come up out of that flood and we are made alive in the Spirit. And we are allowed to enter into the ark of salvation. And that ark is Yeshua. And when we're in Yeshua, then we rise up above the coming judgment. What a wonderful, wonderful picture. It says, not a putting away of the filth of the flesh. So when you're water baptized, you're not just taking a bath. But the answer of a good conscience toward Elohim. It's what you do. It's an act of obedience when you believe upon Yeshua. Through the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah, who having gone into heaven, is at the right hand of Elohim, messengers or angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So all the angels are beneath him. All authorities and powers are subjected to Yeshua. And I want you to see that Yeshua suffered the flood of judgment for our sins and not for his. So go with me over to Isaiah chapter 53 and we'll pick up with verse 4. Now this is Isaiah speaking on behalf of Israel. But it applies directly to every person. And when we believe upon Yeshua, then we're grafted in to Israel. It says, truly he, Yeshua, has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Notice there are sicknesses and there are pains. Yet we reckoned him smitten, stricken by Elohim, and afflicted. In other words, the Jewish people reckoned Yeshua smitten and stricken because of his own sins. In other words, he got what he deserved. That Elohim was punishing him for his sins. In other words, he was taking his own judgment. The judgment that he deserved because he was a sinner. But that's not true. Verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookednesses. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. What does that mean? The punishment that brought peace to us was upon him. And by his stripes or his wounds, we are healed. Verse 6 says, we all like sheep went astray. Who went astray? Did he go astray? No. We all like sheep went astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way doing what's right in our own eyes, just like the people during the time of Noah. And Yah has laid on him the crookedness of us all. 
So Yeshua suffered the floodwaters of our judgment so that we could be declared right through belief in Him, a belief that produces obedience, and find ourselves in Him, in the ark of salvation, rising above the coming judgment. Hallelujah. Now here's a very interesting passage in Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 38. And this is going to tell us that Jonah, Jonah the prophet, you may say Jonah, is in a lot of ways a picture of Yeshua. Now we know that Jonah was running from the will of Abba. That's certainly not a picture of Yeshua. But what happened with Jonah when he was thrown into the deep and he was swallowed up by a great fish and he was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so also Yeshua, the son of Adam, would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So let's read it. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So let's look into the story of Jonah and let's see how what Jonah experienced pictures what Yeshua went through when he died on the tree, was buried, and was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, and then was raised from the dead. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. And Jonah prayed to Yah his Elohim from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called to Yah because of my distress. Think about the distress Yeshua went through. And he answered me from the stomach of Sheol. This is a picture of Yeshua being in the heart of the earth. From the stomach of Sheol, I cried. And you heard my voice, for you threw me into the deep. Remember, he suffered the judgment waters for us. For you threw me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. This is a picture of judgment. All your breakers and your waves passed over me. Billows of judgment. Your breakers and your waves passed over me. I suffered on behalf of mankind. So I said, I have been driven away from your eyes. Would I ever look again toward your set apart hekal, your set apart temple? Waters encompass me unto life. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the base of the mountains. You remember we read that the waters went up so high that it covered over all the high mountains. The earth with its bars were behind me forever. Here it is. But you brought up my life from the pit. Hallelujah. Oh, Yah, my Elohim. When my life fainted within me, I remembered Yah, and my prayer went up to you into your set-apart Hekal. Those observing false worthlessnesses, idolatry, paganism, and the like, forsake their own loving commitment. But I slaughter to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I pay what I have vowed. Deliverance is of Yah, verse 10, then Yah spoke to the fish, and it vomited Yonah onto the dry land. So that's speaking of resurrection. The scripture says it was Abba Yah who raised Yeshua from the dead. Hallelujah. And now let's go into the future. And let's look at some verses that tell us that Yeshua's return is as the days of Noah. So you got to have a foundation in the Torah if you're going to be able to interpret all of Scripture correctly. So we see that what was started in the book of Bereshith, the book of beginnings, 
continues all throughout the Bible. What was done in the past will be done again in the future. There's nothing new under the sun. So when you understand these principles, then you can understand what's going to take place in the future and you can walk in the light and not in the darkness. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 24 and pick up with verse 29. It says, And immediately after the distress of those days, this is talking about the great tribulation period, or what's called the time of Jacob's trouble. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then the sign of the son of Adam, speaking of Yeshua, shall appear in the heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, and they shall see the son of Adam coming on the clouds of the heaven with power and much esteem. And he shall send his messengers, his angels, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his chosen ones, his bride, the righteous ones, the obedient ones, from the four winds and from one end of the heavens to the other. Now look at verse 36. It says, but concerning that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the messengers or the angels of the heavens, but my Father only. This is Yeshua speaking. And as the days of Noah, isn't that interesting? Now Yeshua is going to compare what's going to happen in the future with what's already happened in the past. And as the days of Noah, so also shall the coming of the son of Adam be. For as they were in the days before the flood, remember, Noah was preaching, he was proclaiming, he was trying to get the people to respond and perform teshuvah and turn to the master in obedience, to repent, get their hearts right. It says, for as they were in the days before the flood, they were just eating, and drinking, and marrying, and giving in marriage. They were just living, but they weren't listening, and they weren't turning to the master. It says, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. So Abiyah was patient up until the day that Noah and his family entered into the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. They weren't paying attention. They were walking in darkness. Their ears were stopped up. Their eyes were blind. Their thoughts were evil. It says, so also shall the coming of the son of Adam be. It's going to be the same way. Those of us who believe in Yeshua and who walk in his Torah lifestyle, we're going to be preaching. We're going to be sharing the good news. We're going to be calling people to repent. We're going to be preaching Teshuvah to return to the master in obedience. But there'll be many people whose eyes are dim, whose ears are stopped up, whose hearts are hard, and they're not listening. They're they're doing what they want to do. They're, They're doing what's right in their own eyes. Maybe they have a form of religion that runs contrary to Scripture, but they believe they're right and that's the way they like it. Well, they're not listening, and when Yeshua comes, it's going to be too late. Verse 40 Then two shall be in the field, the one is taken, and the one is left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal, one is taken, and one is left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your master is coming. And know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Because of this, be ready too. For the son of Adam is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. And so again, Yeshua uses this story in the Torah about Noah as a righteous man and how he was saved by Elohim, by entering into that ark of salvation and how the others were unrighteous and wicked and wouldn't listen and wouldn't hear and they all perished in the waters of the flood. So let's go a little further. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll pick up with verse 1. And I want you to see here that Shaul is prophesying about what men will be like in the last days. And you'll see that it's exactly the same as in the days of Noah. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, hard times shall come. Your Bible may say perilous. Perilous times are coming. We need to know that. And we need to prepare for that. We don't want to be caught off guard. Difficult times are coming. Perilous times are coming. Verse 2, for men shall be lovers of self, self-focused, selfish, loving themselves, worshiping themselves, lovers of silver or lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence but denying its power. Turn away from these. When I think about what we're going through here in this nation, even today, when I think about all of the violence, when I think about the murder, when I think about the mayhem, when I think about the cities burning, when I think about all of the lies that are spoken in politics, I can see these things. I can see that these things are taking place even today. And so we're getting close. Second Timothy chapter three and verse 13 says, but evil men and imposters shall go on to the worse, leading astray and being led astray. So evil men and imposters will get worse and worse. Again, very much like in the days of Noah. They're going to lead people astray and they're being led astray themselves. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, For there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching. There's coming a time when you can speak the truth in purity. I'm talking about the unadulterated truth and they're not hearing it. They don't want to hear it. They refuse to hear it because the truth brings a challenge. They don't want to be challenged. They like what they're doing. And there's coming a time, this passage says, that they shall not bear sound teaching. They're not hearing it. And this is also religious people. I think it's probably more religious people than not because they don't want to hear sound teaching. They just want to hear what they want to hear. But according to their own desires, remember they do what's right in their own eyes, they shall heap up for themselves teachers Tickling the ear. They just want you to tell them what they want you to tell them. And they shall indeed turn their ears away from the truth. I'm not hearing it. And be turned aside to myths. And then go with me over to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we'll pick up with verse 1. This all sounds very much like the days of Noah. But these are the things that are going to happen in the future. And they're happening, many of these things are happening even right now. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, But there also came to be false prophets among the people, as also among you there shall be false teachers. So there's going to be false teachers who shall secretly bring in destructive heresies and deny the master who bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many shall follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So because these false teachers are bringing their destructive heresies, they're going to cause the people to be led away so that when the truth is spoken, people aren't going to hear it and the way of truth is going to be evil spoken of. Verse 3, And in greed with fabricated words, they shall use you for gain. In other words, they're just about the money. They're doing it for gain, for the money. 
From of old, their judgment does not linger and their destruction does not slumber. It's coming. The judgment's coming. For if Elohim did not spare the messengers or the angels who sinned, but sent them to Tartaros and delivered them into chains of darkness to be kept for judgment, verse 5, and did not spare the world of old, but preserved Noah, a proclaimer of righteousness. That tells us that he was preaching the truth in those days. And seven others, bringing in the flood on the world of the wicked, and having reduced to ashes the cities of Sedom and Amorah, condemned them to destruction, having made them an example to those who afterward would live wickedly, and rescued righteous Lot. See, the righteous are always rescued. Who was oppressed with the indecent behavior of the lawless. For day after day, that righteous man dwelling among them tortured his righteous being by seeing and hearing their lawless works. Then, if Abiyah did all of that, then... Yah knows how to rescue the reverent ones from trial, from trial, from tribulation. He's not going to sweep us away to avoid all trouble, take us up to heaven and all of that. You know that very popular doctrine amongst religion. But he's going to keep us safe in the midst of the trial. He's going to keep us safe in the midst of the tribulation. He's going to deliver us. It says, and to keep the unrighteous unto the day of judgment to be punished. So there is a day of judgment coming for all unrighteous people. For the righteous, he's going to keep us safe. We are in Yeshua. We are in the ark of safety. We are in the ark of salvation. And as long as we remain there, as long as we continue in our belief in Yeshua, a belief that produces obedience, then when the judgment comes, we're going to rise above the judgment waters and be safe with Yeshua. Go with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll pick up with verse 1. This is going to tell us that the day of Yah comes as a thief. It says, Now, brothers, as to the times and the seasons, you do not need to be written to. In other words, you understand the times and the seasons. For you yourselves know very well that the day of Yah comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, doesn't say when you say, you righteous ones. It says for when they say, the world, peace and safety. In other words, they're just going on about life. They're, they're saying peace and safety. We're all just doing fine. Then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. Well, this is exactly what happened during the days of Noah. They were just going on about their business, marrying, giving in marriage, eating, drinking, and then sudden destruction came upon them when it started raining, and then it was too late. Verse 4, But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief, because you are people of revelation, you are people of the Word, you have the indwelling set-apart spirit of Abba Yah who teaches you all things, who leads you in all truth. You have the Torah because the command is a lamp and the Torah is a light. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then we should not sleep as others do, but we should watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But we who are of the day should be sober, putting on the breastplate of belief and love and as a helmet, the expectation of deliverance. There it is. As a helmet, we have the expectation of deliverance. We expect to be delivered. Doesn't mean that we're going to be taken out and never see any trouble. It means that we're going to be kept safe in the midst of the trouble. We have an expectation of deliverance. 
because Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, to his wrath. We're going to experience the wrath of Hasatan. He's going to fight against the children of Elohim. But we're not going to experience Elohim's wrath. We're not going to experience Elohim's judgment. We're going to rise above Elohim's judgment. It says, but to obtain deliverance through our master, Yeshua Messiah, who died for us. He suffered our judgment so that we, whether awake, whether we're alive or asleep or whether we've died, should live together with him. Now, let's go over and look at a couple of other passages. And this next one tells us about a flood of deception that's coming. We've been talking about a flood or the flood the flood during Noah's day and the flood that's coming of judgment in the future. But there's a flood of deception that's coming. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. As to the coming of our master Yeshua Messiah and our gathering together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled either by spirit, some evil spirit speaking to you, or by word, something that people are saying, or by letter, some forgery that someone's written, as if from us, as if the day of Yah has come already. All right, so they were concerned that the day of Yah had already come. Some of them were troubled. And Shaul was saying, don't be troubled about that, because it hadn't come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first, the falling away of those who claim to be believers in Yeshua. This is talking about religious people who will begin to embrace popular culture, turn away from the Bible and from the morality of Scripture and begin to embrace what modern culture says is right. There's going to be a great falling away that's to come first. And the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. So the man of lawlessness is the anti-Messiah, and he's going to be revealed after the falling away takes place. The mystery of lawlessness is already in effect, and I believe that the falling away is even taking place now. We can see it. The son of destruction, he's called, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Elohim in the dwelling place of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. This is speaking of the abomination of desolation written of by the prophet Daniel. And the anti-Messiah is going to erect an image of himself in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem when that takes place. And he's going to demand that everyone worships him. Verse 5. Do you not remember that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him, the anti-Messiah, to be revealed in his time. What restrains the anti-Messiah from being revealed? The falling away. We just read it. The falling away must come first. That's the what. The what is the falling away must take place and then the anti-Messiah will be revealed. Verse 7, for the secret of lawlessness is already at work. Only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. The one who's restraining here, the he, is the anti-Messiah. What is he restraining? He's restraining the coming of our master Yeshua Messiah. So the one who restrains the coming of our master Yeshua Messiah, the anti-Messiah, must Come up out of the midst of the people. He must be revealed. He must come up out of the midst of the people. And then when he comes up out of the midst of the people, the lawless one shall be revealed. You're going to be able to see him. Whom the master shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, with the breath of his mouth, with the word that comes out of his mouth. And bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming. So when Yeshua comes, he's going to bring to naught the anti-Messiah. He's going to defeat the anti-Messiah. He's going to throw him and the false prophet in the, into the lake of fire. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all power and with all signs and wonders of falsehood. These are lying signs and wonders that will deceive many. 
and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing. In other words, deception that will lead people to unrighteousness. With all deception that leads the masses to unrighteousness. We're talking about those who are perishing, who will perish in the judgment that is to come. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth. If you're unwilling to receive the love of the truth, you're going to be deceived unto unrighteousness and then you'll perish. It says, because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. To be saved, you have to receive the love of the truth. You have to believe in Yeshua with a belief that produces obedience. And then you can be in Him, in the ark of salvation and rise above the judgment. Verse 11, for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion. So number one, Hasatan is going to send delusion. It's going to send deception and deceive people into unrighteousness. But this says that because they would not receive a love of the truth, Elohim is going to send them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth. So there comes a time if you refuse to believe the truth, not only are you being deceived by Hasatan, but you receive from Elohim a working of delusion so that you will believe the falsehood, so that you will be judged because you did not believe the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. So there's a flood of deception, a flood of, of delusion that's coming upon the wicked. And there's a judgment that is coming. And we're going to finally finish up with this passage that tells us that the final judgment is not a judgment of water, but it's a judgment of fire. As you recall in our Torah portion, if you go back and read the entire Torah portion, you know that Abba Yah made a covenant. And his covenant was, his promise was that he would no longer, never again, judge mankind, judge the earth with floodwaters. And he put his rainbow in the cloud as a sign of that covenant that he will never again judge the earth with water, with flood water. So this final judgment that is to come in the future is not one of water, but it's one of fire. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Knowing this first, that mockers shall come in the last days with mocking, they're going to be mocking, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? They're mocking. He's not coming. They're walking according to their own lusts. They're just like the the men and women of the days of Noah. And they're mocking people who have belief. And they're saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues as from the beginning of creation. Everything's the same. Nothing's changed. For they choose to have this hidden from them. So they, they refuse to understand these principles that the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, we read about that in Genesis 1, the, the earth and the waters were separated. The earth came up out of the water. And in the water, because of the flood in, in Genesis 6, by the word of Elohim, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. And the present heavens and the earth are treasured up by the same word, so the present heavens and the earth are reserved by the word of Elohim. Something's going to happen in the future. Notice it says, being kept for fire, a fire judgment. There's a fire coming. Everybody needs to understand this. So I'm like Noah today, and I'm speaking through these cameras to anyone and everyone who will hear this message. And I am calling on people to perform teshuvah, to turn to the master in obedience, to repent, to get your hearts right, to begin obeying the scripture. Why? Because there's a fire coming. I can imagine Noah saying there's a flood coming and all the people laughing at him. And I'm saying there's a fire coming. 
because that's what the scripture says right here. And the present heavens and the earth are treasured up by the same word being kept for fire to a day of judgment and destruction of wicked men. Wicked men are going to be judged and wicked men are going to be destroyed. You can't live doing what's right in your own eyes. You have to believe upon Yeshua and obey the scriptures. If you're going to find yourself in the ark of salvation and rise above the judgment that's coming. Verse 8, But beloved ones, let not this one matter be hidden from you, that with Yah one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yah is not slow in regard to His promise. In other words, don't get discouraged. He is coming. Yeshua is going to return. There will be a judgment. Yeshua is going to gather up his bride, he's going to gather up those who follow him, his righteous ones. Yah is not slow in regard to the promise, as some count slowness. Those mockers, you know. But is patient toward us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's patient. He's patiently waiting. He's waiting. He wants us to continue to preach this word, to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins, to go into all the world and preach this good news message of belief in Yeshua that produces obedience. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10, But the day of Yah shall come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with intense heat. This is that judgment of fire. And the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Seeing all these are to be destroyed in this way, there's a fire coming. What kind of people ought you to be in set apart behavior and reverence? In other words, don't you think you ought to be obeying the Bible? If you know that all of these are going to be destroyed by fire, that there's a fire coming, what kind of people ought you to be in set-apart behavior, not acting like the rest of the world, not saying that you believe but you don't obey? What kind of people ought you to be in set-apart behavior and reverence? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of Elohim. So we ought to live every day like He's coming that day. Through which the heavens shall be destroyed, being set on fire, and the elements melt with intense heat. But according to His promise, we wait. We wait for a renewed heavens and a renewed earth, in which righteousness dwells. Oh, it's coming. What a beautiful promise that is. We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth and righteousness is going to dwell. So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless. In other words, be like Noah. Be one who is righteous, who is living rightly. Be one who is spotless and blameless and perfect. And so knowing these things, that what took place in the days of Noah will take place again in the future. We're not children of the darkness. We're not asleep. We're not walking in the darkness. We are children of the light. We have the Torah. We have all of Scripture. We have the indwelling set-apart spirit of Abiyah teaching us and leading us into all truth and understanding. It's time that we be prepared and empowered to go and preach this message of Teshuvah, to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in all the nations, as Yeshua said, and then 
the end will come. Hallelujah.